Everything, remember, has a dharma. Every creature, every rose, and every human being has a dharma. You're already fulfilling it physically. You're already in the bodies that you were intended to be in. Remember what I said before, it is not about where you are, it's about what direction you're headed. And as long as you know you're heading in the direction of staying here in meaning. Now, this concept of a calling, I mean, I wrote a whole book about it. It's called Inspiration, In Spirit. And the subtitle is called Your Ultimate Calling. So I'm going to introduce a word here to help you to identify your calling. And that word is passion. And it doesn't make any difference to me whether that passion has anything to do with making a living or uh, it's a part of the DOT, the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. What is it that you find passion about and the only condition I place on it is that it is in alignment with God or with your source. All right? So that your passion, if your passion is about killing other people, for example, if your passion is about stealing, if your passion is about, uh, I often said that there's two ways to have the tallest building in town. One of the ways to have the tallest building in town, always, is to go around and knock down anybody else's building when they start getting taller than yours. So as soon as they get up, if you're at the 44 floors and they get to 43, 44, you just go over and you put some explosives in there and you just blow it up. And you say, I, I have the tallest building in town. And this is, by the way, our collective ego. <laughs> this is what we do in our society and in our world, and which is about, if you really want to know my passion and my calling, it's about shifting the entire consciousness of this planet before I leave it. And that's why the film titled The Shift is so significant to me, because I know that if I can get 10 million people to watch that film, The Shift, if I can get 10 million people in America and Canada to watch that film, that we reach something called Pi, 3.1416, remember? <laughs> and if you can get 3.1416 percentage of a population to align, the rest of it's called a critical mass in physics. You reach what is called phase transition. And if you align enough people or electrons or subatomic particles up and align them in a certain way in an energy field, and you reach what they call the hundredth monkey, when you reach that point, all the rest of the electrons or the people in that energy field begin to align as well. And we have aligned ourselves collectively with a consciousness that uh, allows for people to knock down other people's buildings. The other way to have the tallest building in town is to always work on your own building and not be concerned with anybody else's building or what anyone else out there is doing or being consumed with trying to compete with or win or defend. To listen to your calling. So your calling is the thing within you that has your attention, that has your passionate attention. And it doesn't make any difference whether it makes sense to anybody else. It's the thing that you feel inside of you that you're here for. It's Mr. Holland in Mr. Holland's opus. And here's the secret. Here's the thing that I learned. That it's the presence of the passion. That when you have the presence of the passion within you for what it is that you feel is your calling, Everything else will take care of itself. That is an indication that you have God within you and guiding you. The word enthusiasm and theos, yasm, translates to the God within in Greek. The God within. When you are enthusiastic about something, anything, when you have that kind of internal knowing that this is what I'm doing. And sometimes you have to, uh, you know, that Shakespeare's 
he wasn't just a great writer, he was an incredible philosopher. Probably the most famous lines from Shakespeare are from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. And that's a very profound question. But what follows that is much more profound. He said, after to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the minds of men to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and thus by opposing end them. You have to ask the question and that's what this program is about and that's what the movie is about and that's what the book is about and that's what all of it is about. To be or not to be? Am I going to be who I came into this world to be and there's something inside of me that has always been calling me to it? Or am I going to allow the slings and arrows of an outrageous fortune that has been imposed upon me by others to dictate my dharma? That's really the question. And it's a question that you can answer and respond to and live with. As if your prayer is you talking to God, your intuition is God talking to you. It's God talking to you. It's the presence of higher frequencies and higher energy saying to you, listen to me, listen to me, pay attention. There's an accident coming. Slow down. That person in front of you who's going slow, thank them for slowing you down. Because if you would have gone around them, you'd have had a head-on collision. Or there's somebody waiting up there to give you a ticket. How many times have you wanted to get around somebody, you want to get around, you want to get around, and you say, oh, well, and you stay. And then you look up there, and there's somebody sitting up there with one of those uh, little ticket guns ready to hand you uh, a, a ticket from a radar reading. That person was put in front of you to slow you down. And it's not an accident. Now, here's the weirdest I'm giving a talk the next day on you don't have to have accidents. It's five o'clock in the morning and I'm out running. And while I'm out running, I trip over a curb that someone placed in the middle of the road. I don't know how they did it, but during the middle of the night, they raised the sidewalk this much. <laughs> At least that's the way it seemed to me because it had never been there before. It was out in front of my own home. And all of a sudden, I'm like this, and I go into that slowed down time thing I was talking about before, and I see, but I was sprinting because the last three or four uh, minutes of my run, I usually sprint. And I'm sprinting, and I hit that thing, and I'm going very fast, and it's all concrete, asphalt. And I see that I am about to land my head on it, and I can see it in my arm and my side and my face, and I'm tumbling, tumbling on the cement at five o'clock in the morning. And I get up and I finish my run and I walk into the house and my wife thinks that I've been attacked by a polar bear because <laughs> that's how I looked. Blood down my face, scabs, you know, were going to be forming and I'm giving a talk the next day <laughs> on how to avoid having accidents <laughs> and moving into higher consciousness, all right? So when I was giving the talk and I got to this point and then I started pointing out all of the things you know, on my hips and my legs and then over here and uh, my face and so on. And I said to them, look, I was at 100,000 cycles per second. I was really connected to spirit while I was running. I had been meditating. And then we have been having a problem with one of our daughters who has been taking a different path in her life than... Um, what has been comfortable for us. And she has experimented with drugs and drinking and uh, has had a uh, head-on collision and had to be cut out of a car and, uh, and she now had gone back into some more of that kind of behavior when we thought that that was past us. And um, I was running and I was thinking about her and worried about her and consumed with fear for her and when I went into that fear mode and I got very, very frightened and very upset and very hurt is when I tripped over that uh, thing. And when you leave 100,000, 80,000, 70, and you move into these lower frequencies, 
and accidents occur when you shift back into the place where there are accidents at 20,000 cycles per second. If you can sense yourself in fear, in stress, in shame, in anxiety, in all of these kinds of awarenesses and move out of them and get yourself back to God, to spirit, to love, to higher and faster energy, you can avoid all of these things. And when they happen, again, take responsibility for them without guilt. Not going around telling myself, I, sh you know, I had this accident and, uh, and I'm being punished and all of that. No. But that I now have the results in my body of this action. And I'm taking responsibility for getting rid of it. And I can't take responsibility for getting rid of it unless I take responsibility for having it. Not with guilt, but with your sense of everything that happens to me, I have something to learn from. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for all of these struggles and tough times and accidents to remind me to move and stay in a higher place. The lowest frequencies are the frequencies that we call solid. And as we move out of the solid frequencies, remember that our eyes, our ears, these are the senses that pick up the energy and give us the information. As we move beyond the senses or into the higher senses like sound and light, we're moving into faster energies. So we've got solid, and then we've got this intermediate dimension called sound, and then we've got light, and then ultimately we move into the very fastest and highest frequencies of all called spirit. And these very high and very fast frequencies are energies, and they are accessed by using your intuition and your insight, and largely through meditation and getting quiet and making conscious contact with God. Imagine a life where nothing can phase you, where stress, anxiety, and negativity have no power over your peace of mind. What if I told you that this isn't just a fantasy, but a real possibility? That by mastering a few key principles, you can become unshakable in the face of life's challenges? Well, that's exactly what we're going to explore today. I'm going to share with you the 10 basic principles that have transformed my own life and the lives of countless others. These are the principles that enable you to cultivate a mindset of resilience, inner peace, and unwavering strength. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, but my life is so challenging right now. I'm dealing with insert personal struggle here. How can a few principles really make a difference? And I understand that skepticism because I've been there myself. There was a time in my life when I felt like I was at the mercy of my circumstances when every little setback or criticism would send me into a spiral of stress and self-doubt. I was reactive, easily thrown off balance by the ups and downs of life. But through years of study, introspection, and practice, I discovered that we have far more control over our inner world than we often realize. That by consciously choosing our thoughts, beliefs, and responses, we can create an unshakable foundation of peace and strength. So let's dive into these 10 principles. As we do, I invite you to approach them with an open mind. Some of these ideas might challenge your current ways of thinking. They might push you out of your comfort zone. But I promise you, if you truly absorb and apply these principles, your life will change in ways you never thought possible. The first principle is this, you are not your thoughts. This is the foundation of it all. Most of us are so identified with our thoughts that we believe we are our thoughts. If we think something negative about ourselves, we believe it's true. If we have a fearful or angry thought, we become that fear or anger. But the reality is, thoughts are just mental events that come and go. They are not your true essence. You are the awareness behind the thoughts, the conscious presence that observes them. When you start to understand this at a deep level, it's incredibly liberating. You realize that just because you have a negative thought doesn't mean you have to believe it or react to it. 
you can simply observe it and choose to let it pass by like a cloud in the sky. This principle alone can be life-changing. It enables you to detach from the drama of your mind and rest in the peace of your true self. It's the first step to becoming unaffected by the turbulence of life. The second principle is your perception creates your reality. Have you ever noticed how two people can go through the exact same situation but have completely different experiences of it? One person might find it stressful and overwhelming, while the other finds it exciting and invigorating. This is because our reality is not determined by our external circumstances, but by our perception of those circumstances. It's the meaning we assign to events that shapes our experience. When you deeply grasp this principle, you realize that you have an incredible power. The power to choose your perspective. The power to decide what meaning you give to the events of your life. If you're in the habit of seeing challenges as threats, failures as catastrophes, and criticisms as reflections of your worth, then your reality will be filled with stress and suffering. But if you learn to see challenges as opportunities, failures as feedback, and criticisms as chances to grow, then your reality will be one of resilience and growth. This doesn't mean denying or minimizing the difficulties in your life. It's not about putting on rose-colored glasses and pretending everything is perfect. Rather, it's about consciously choosing the most empowering perspective available to you. It's about asking yourself, what can I learn from this? How can I use this to become stronger, wiser, more compassionate? It's about focusing on what you can control your own mindset and responses rather than what you can't. The third principle is resistance creates suffering. So much of our stress and unhappiness comes from our resistance to what is. We get caught up in thoughts like this shouldn't be happening, it's not fair, I can't handle this. But the reality is, whatever is happening in the present moment is happening. No amount of resistance will change that fact. All resistance does is create tension and struggle within ourselves. I love the analogy of trying to swim upstream. When you're resisting the current of the river, you exhaust yourself and you don't make any progress. But when you turn around and flow with the river, you harness its energy. You move forward with ease. Now, this doesn't mean becoming a passive doormat and just accepting everything that comes your way. There's a difference between acceptance and resignation. Acceptance is about acknowledging reality as it is in this moment so that you can respond to it skillfully. It's about saying, okay, this is what's happening. Now, what's the wisest way for me to navigate this situation? When you practice this kind of acceptance, you conserve your energy. You don't waste it on futile resistance, so you have more to invest in effective action. You become like a willow tree, bending with the wind instead of rigidly resisting it. The fourth principle is your inner state determines your outer experience. We often think that our happiness and peace are dependent on our external circumstances. If we get that promotion, find that perfect relationship, reach that goal weight, then we'll be content. But the truth is, lasting happiness is an inside job. It's the result of the quality of your consciousness, not the content of your life situation. I've met people who have every external trapping of success, wealth, fame, beauty, but are deeply unhappy. And I've met people who have very little in terms of material possessions, but radiate joy and peace. The difference lies in their inner state the quality of their thoughts, emotions, and beliefs, the degree to which they are connected to their own deeper essence. When you understand this principle, you stop chasing after external things to make you happy. You start focusing on cultivating the inner qualities that create true fulfillment things like gratitude, compassion, curiosity, purpose. You realize that you have the power to generate feelings of peace, joy, and love regardless of what's happening around you. You become the source of your own well-being rather than being dependent on circumstances. This is true freedom, the ability to determine the quality of your inner life no matter what the outer world is presenting you with. The fifth principle is your attention is your most valuable resource. In today's world, there are so many things competing for our attention notifications, advertisements, social media, endless to-do lists. It's easy to get caught up in the noise and lose sight of what truly matters. 
but your attention is precious. What you give your attention to grows. If you're constantly focusing on your fears, worries, and complaints, you'll amplify those things. But if you direct your attention towards what you're grateful for, what you appreciate about yourself and others, and what possibilities exist, you'll cultivate more of that positive reality. One of the most powerful practices you can engage in is mindfulness. This is simply the practice of being fully present in the current moment without judgment. When you're mindful, you're not lost in thoughts about the past or future. You're here now attentive to what's actually happening. Mindfulness enables you to catch yourself when you're getting pulled into negative thought patterns. It allows you to step back from the chatter of your mind and reconnect with the peace and clarity of the present. It also enhances your ability to focus on what's truly important. When you're not constantly reacting to every stimulus and distraction, you can be more intentional about where you invest your energy and attention. So start treating your attention as the valuable resource it is. Be discerning about what you allow into your mental space. Cultivate mindfulness so you can be more present and purposeful. Your attention shapes your reality, so direct it wisely. The sixth principle is you are always choosing. Every moment of every day you are making choices. Even when you feel like you have to do something, you're still choosing to do it. Even when you feel like you're reacting automatically, you're choosing that reaction. When you deeply understand this principle, it's incredibly empowering. You realize that you are responsible for your life. Not in the sense of blaming yourself for everything that happens to you, but in the sense of recognizing your power to choose your response to what happens. Viktor Frankl, the psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor, put it eloquently when he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. When you believe that you are at the mercy of external forces, you feel powerless. But when you recognize that you always have a choice, even if it's just a choice in perspective or attitude, you reclaim your agency. You start paying attention to the choices you're making throughout your day. Notice when you're acting out of habit or reactivity and pause. Take a breath into that space between stimulus and response. Then consciously choose the response that aligns with your values and goals. Over time, as you practice this principle, you'll develop a profound sense of inner freedom. You'll know that no matter what life throws at you, you always have the power to choose your inner state and your outer actions. The seventh principle is authenticity is magnetic. In a world that's constantly telling us who we should be, what we should want, and how we should live, it takes courage to be authentically yourself. But when you have the boldness to stand in your truth, something magical happens. You start to attract people and situations that resonate with your authentic energy. You find that you don't have to strive and struggle to make things happen because you're aligned with your natural flow. This doesn't mean that life becomes perfect. It doesn't mean you won't face challenges or that everyone will like and agree with you. But it does mean that you'll face those challenges from a place of wholeness and integrity. It means you'll attract relationships and opportunities that are a true match for who you are. So often we dim our light, hide our quirks, and silence our true voices because we're afraid of rejection or judgment. But the irony is, it's often the very things that make us unique that also make us attractive, interesting, and impactful. Think about the people you most admire and are drawn to. Chances are they're not the ones who are trying to fit in and please everyone. They're the ones who are unapologetically themselves, who have the courage to stand out and speak their truth. So start embracing your own authenticity. Stop trying to fit into boxes that don't align with your soul. Trust that as you show up fully as yourself, you'll magnetize the right people and opportunities. This doesn't mean you shouldn't grow, evolve, and work on yourself, but it does mean that your growth should be towards more of who you truly are, not towards some external standard of who you think you should be. The eighth principle is forgiveness frees you. Holding on to anger, resentment, and bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It doesn't hurt them, but it slowly destroys your own peace and well-being. 
Forgiveness isn't about condoning hurtful behavior or letting people off the hook. It's not saying that what someone did was okay. Rather, it's choosing to release yourself from the pain and weight of the past. It's choosing to reclaim your power and freedom in the present. When you hold on to grievances, you're keeping yourself stuck in a victim mentality. You're giving your power away to the person or situation that hurt you. You're letting the past dictate your present emotional state. But when you forgive, you're saying, I'm done letting this weigh me down. I'm ready to move forward unburdened by bitterness. I choose peace over pain. Forgiveness is an act of self-love and self-respect. This doesn't mean forgiveness is easy. When you've been deeply hurt, it can feel almost impossible to let go. It's a process, one that often involves feeling and acknowledging the full depth of your pain before you can release it. But as you practice forgiveness, you'll find that it gets easier. You'll find that you have more energy and mental space for the things that truly matter to you. You'll find that you're able to be more present, joyful, and at peace. So start practicing forgiveness. Start with the small things and work your way up to the bigger hurts. Remember that forgiveness is for you, not for anyone else. It's a gift you give yourself. The ninth principle is gratitude is the antidote to suffering. It's easy to get fixated on what's going wrong in our lives, on what we're lacking or struggling with. Our minds have a negativity bias, meaning we tend to notice and dwell on the bad more than the good. But when we cultivate gratitude, we start to retrain our minds. We start to look for and appreciate all the blessings and gifts in our lives, big and small. We shift our focus from what's missing to what's present. And as we do this, our entire experience of life begins to shift. We realize that even in the midst of challenges and hardships, there's always something to be grateful for. We start to see the hidden blessings in our difficulties, the opportunities for growth and resilience. Attitude doesn't deny or minimize our pain. It's not about pasting on a fake smile and pretending everything is wonderful. Rather, it's about holding both the joy and the sorrow, the blessings and the struggles. It's about choosing to focus on and appreciate the good even as we navigate the hard. The practice of gratitude has been scientifically shown to increase happiness, improve relationships, reduce stress, and even strengthen the immune system. It's a simple but profound habit that can radically alter your experience of life. So start cultivating gratitude. Keep a gratitude journal, listing a few things you're thankful for each day. Share your appreciation with others, telling them what you value about them. Look for the small moments of beauty and kindness in your daily life. As you make gratitude a regular practice, you'll find that even the toughest days hold glimmers of grace and goodness. You'll find that you're more resilient, more open to joy, and more connected to the abundance of life. The tenth and final principle is you are here to grow and give. So often we get caught up in the pursuit of external achievements, validation, and pleasure. We think that if we just get the right job, the right relationship, the right body, the right, the right possessions, then we'll be happy and fulfilled. But deep down, we know that's not true. We know that no external thing can give us lasting satisfaction. We know that we're here for something more. I believe that we each have two core purposes in life to grow and to give, to continually learn, evolve, and expand into the fullness of our potential, and to contribute and be of service to something beyond ourselves. When we align our lives with these purposes, we tap into a deep sense of meaning and fulfillment. We feel that we're a part of something greater, that our existence matters. We're no longer just going through the motions or chasing fleeting pleasures, but are engaged in the grand adventure of life. Growth doesn't always feel good in the moment. It can be uncomfortable, even painful, to stretch beyond our comfort zones to confront our limitations and shadows. But it's in this stretching that we become more of who we're meant to be. It's how we build strength, wisdom, and character. Giving also requires us to step beyond our self-focus, to consider how we can make a difference to others. It asks us to share our gifts, our time, our energy in service of something we value. But in this giving, we often receive far more than we offer. We experience connection, purpose, and the joy of making a positive impact. Your specific path of growth and giving is unique to you. It may involve creating art that inspires others or being a compassionate listener for a friend in need. 
It may mean starting a business that solves a problem or raising children with love and wisdom. It may be as simple as tending a garden with care or as grand as leading a social movement. The form doesn't matter as much as the intention and the heart you bring to it. When you commit to continual growth and heartfelt giving, you'll find that your life becomes an ever unfolding expression of your deepest values and aspirations. So keep growing, keep giving, keep asking yourself, how can I learn and evolve today? How can I contribute and make a difference? Know that as you do this, you're aligning with the highest purpose of life itself. Those are the 10 principles. Let's take a moment to review them. You are not your thoughts. Your perception creates your reality. Resistance creates suffering. Your inner state determines your outer experience. Your attention is your most valuable resource. You are always choosing. Authenticity is magnetic. Forgiveness frees you. Gratitude is the antidote to suffering. You are here to grow and give. These principles, when truly absorbed and applied, have the power to transform your life from the inside out. They can help you navigate the inevitable ups and downs of life with greater ease, resilience, and joy. They can guide you towards a life of authentic expression, meaningful contribution, and deep inner peace. But intellectual understanding is not enough. These principles must be lived, practiced, embodied. They're not a quick fix, but a lifelong journey of growth and awakening. So start where you are. Choose one principle that resonates with you and begin to apply it. Have you ever found yourself feeling lonely or unfulfilled even when you're surrounded by people? Do you struggle to find happiness and contentment within yourself, always seeking validation and joy from external sources? If so, you're not alone. In fact, learning to be happy alone is one of the greatest challenges we face as human beings, but it's also one of the most rewarding. You see, from a young age, we're taught that happiness comes from the outside world. We're told that we need to have the perfect relationship, the dream job, the fancy car, or the lavish lifestyle to be truly happy. But the truth is, none of those things can give us lasting fulfillment if we haven't first learned to be happy with ourselves. So how do we do that? How do we cultivate a deep sense of self-love, self-acceptance, and inner peace, regardless of our external circumstances? It starts with a shift in mindset, a willingness to let go of our preconceived notions of happiness and embrace a new way of being. First and foremost, we need to recognize that being alone does not equal being lonely. In fact, some of the most fulfilling and transformative moments in our lives often happen when we're by ourselves. It's in those quiet moments of solitude that we have the opportunity to connect with our true selves, to explore our passions and interests, and to cultivate a sense of inner strength and resilience. But for many of us, the idea of being alone is terrifying. We've been conditioned to believe that we need others to complete us, to validate our worth, and to give our lives meaning. We fear the silence, the stillness, and the uncertainty that comes with being alone. But what if I told you that those fears are actually holding you back from your greatest potential? What if I told you that embracing solitude is the key to unlocking your true happiness and fulfillment? You see, when we rely on others for our happiness, we give away our power, we become dependent on external validation and approval, always seeking the next fix of attention or affection. But when we learn to be happy alone, we take back that power. We become self-sufficient, self-reliant, and self-assured. So how do we start? The first step is to get comfortable with discomfort. Learning to be happy alone often means facing our deepest fears and insecurities head on. It means sitting with the uncomfortable emotions that arise when we're by ourselves without trying to distract or numb ourselves. This can be challenging at first, especially if we spent years avoiding our own company. But with practice and patience, we can learn to embrace the discomfort and see it as an opportunity for growth and self-discovery. One of the best ways to do this is through mindfulness and meditation. By taking just a few minutes each day to sit in stillness and focus on our breath, we can begin to cultivate a sense of inner peace and calm. 
we can learn to observe our thoughts and emotions without getting caught up in them, and we can start to develop a deeper sense of self-awareness and self-compassion. Another key to learning to be happy alone is to pursue our passions and interests with enthusiasm and curiosity. When we're engaged in activities that light us up and bring us joy, we're less likely to feel lonely or unfulfilled. Whether it's painting, writing, hiking, or playing music, finding hobbies and pursuits that we love can help us build a strong sense of self and purpose. But it's not just about keeping ourselves busy or distracted. Learning to be happy alone also means developing a deep sense of self-love and self-acceptance. It means treating ourselves with kindness and compassion, even when we make mistakes or fall short of our own expectations. One way to cultivate self-love is through positive self-talk and affirmations. Instead of constantly criticizing or judging ourselves, we can learn to speak to ourselves with the same love and encouragement we would offer a dear friend. We can remind ourselves of our strengths, our talents, and our inherent worth, even in moments of doubt or insecurity. Another way to build self-love is through acts of self-care and self-nurturing. This can look different for everyone, but some examples might include taking a relaxing bath, treating ourselves to a healthy meal, or taking a solo trip to a place we've always wanted to visit. The key is to prioritize our own needs and desires without feeling guilty or selfish for doing so. Of course, learning to be happy alone doesn't mean we have to isolate ourselves from others completely. In fact, having strong, supportive relationships is an important part of overall well-being and happiness. But when we learn to be content and fulfilled on our own, we're able to show up in our relationships from a place of wholeness and self-sufficiency rather than neediness or desperation. We're able to give and receive love freely without expectations or attachments. We're able to set healthy boundaries and communicate our needs clearly without fear of rejection or abandonment. And we're able to weather the ups and downs of relationships with grace and resilience, knowing that our happiness and worth are not dependent on anyone else. Ultimately, learning to be happy alone is about cultivating a deep sense of trust and faith in ourselves. It's about believing that we have the strength, the wisdom, and the resilience to handle whatever life throws our way without needing to rely on others to save or complete us. And the beautiful thing is, when we learn to be happy alone, we open ourselves up to even greater happiness and fulfillment in all areas of our lives. We attract people and experiences that align with our true selves, and we're able to create the kind of life we've always dreamed of on our own terms. So if you're struggling to find happiness and contentment within yourself, know that you're not alone. Know that it's possible to cultivate a deep sense of self-love and inner peace, no matter what your external circumstances may be. And know that by learning to be happy alone, you're giving yourself the greatest gift of all, the gift of true freedom, joy, and fulfillment. It won't happen overnight. And it won't always be easy. There will be moments of doubt, fear, and discomfort along the way. But with practice, patience, and self-compassion, you can learn to embrace solitude as a path to your greatest potential and happiness. So start today. Take a few minutes to sit in stillness and connect with your breath. Pursue a passion or hobby that lights you up from the inside out. Speak to yourself with kindness and love, even in moments of struggle or self-doubt and trust that you have everything you need within yourself to create a life of true happiness and fulfillment no matter what challenges come your way. Remember, learning to be happy alone is not about being perfect or having it all figured out. It's about being willing to show up for yourself day after day with curiosity, compassion, and a sense of adventure. It's about embracing the journey of self-discovery and self-love even when it feels scary or uncertain. And as you continue on this path, you may find that being alone is not something to be feared or avoided, but rather something to be cherished and celebrated. You may find that solitude is a source of great strength, creativity, and wisdom, and that it allows you to connect with yourself and the world around you in profound and meaningful ways. So embrace the journey, my friend. Embrace the discomfort, the uncertainty, and the joy that comes with learning to be happy alone. Trust that you are exactly where you need to be and that every step along the way is leading you closer to your true self and your greatest potential. 
and know that you are never truly alone. Even in your moments of deepest solitude, you are connected to a vast and beautiful universe filled with endless possibilities and opportunities for growth and transformation. You are supported by a love that knows no bounds and that is always guiding you towards your highest good. So keep going. Keep showing up for yourself, keep cultivating self-love and self-acceptance, and keep trusting in the journey. And know that by learning to be happy alone, you are not only giving yourself the greatest gift, but you are also inspiring others to do the same. Because when we learn to be happy alone, we create a ripple effect of love, joy, and fulfillment that touches everyone around us. We become a beacon of hope and possibility, reminding others that true happiness comes from within and that we all have the power to create the life we desire, no matter what challenges we may face. As we embark on this journey of learning to be happy alone, it's important to remember that it's not a one-size-fits-all process. What works for one person may not work for another. And that's okay. The key is to be patient, curious, and open to experimentation as you discover what brings you joy and fulfillment. One of the most powerful tools in this process is gratitude. When we focus on the things we're grateful for, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, we shift our mindset from one of lack and scarcity to one of abundance and appreciation. We begin to see the beauty and wonder in the world around us and we cultivate a sense of contentment and peace that comes from within. So start each day by taking a few moments to reflect on the things you're grateful for. It could be something as simple as the warmth of the sun on your face, the taste of your favorite coffee, or the love and support of a dear friend. The more you practice gratitude, the more you'll begin to see the blessings in your life, even in moments of challenge or difficulty. Another key to learning to be happy alone is to embrace your own uniqueness and authenticity. So often, we try to fit into someone else's mold of who we should be or what we should want, rather than honoring our own truth and desires. But when we learn to be true to ourselves, we tap into a deep well of happiness and fulfillment that comes from living in alignment with our values and passions. This means letting go of the need for external validation or approval and instead trusting in our own inner wisdom and intuition. It means being willing to take risks to try new things and to follow our own path, even if it looks different from everyone else's and it means celebrating our own quirks, eccentricities, and imperfections, knowing that they are what make us beautifully and uniquely ourselves. Of course, embracing our authenticity doesn't mean we have to do everything alone. In fact, having a strong support system of friends, family, and loved ones is an important part of overall well-being and happiness. But when we learn to be happy alone, we're able to show up in those relationships from a place of wholeness and self-sufficiency rather than neediness or codependency. We're able to give and receive love freely without expectations or attachments. We're able to communicate our needs and boundaries clearly without fear of rejection or abandonment. And we're able to weather the ups and downs of relationships with grace and resilience, knowing that our happiness and worth are not dependent on anyone else. Another important aspect of learning to be happy alone is to cultivate a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. This doesn't necessarily mean we have to have it all figured out or know exactly what we want to do with our lives. But it does mean taking the time to explore our passions, values, and interests, and finding ways to contribute to the world in a way that feels authentic and fulfilling to us. This could mean volunteering for a cause we care about, starting a creative project or business, or simply being kind and compassionate to those around us. The key is to find something that lights us up from the inside out, and that gives us a sense of purpose and direction, even in moments of uncertainty or doubt. And as we continue on this journey of self-discovery and self-love, it's important to remember that it's not a linear process. There will be ups and downs, moments of clarity and moments of confusion, times when we feel like we're making progress and times when we feel like we're stuck or going backwards. But through it all, we can learn to be kind and compassionate with ourselves, to treat ourselves with the same love and understanding we would offer a dear friend. We can learn to let go of perfectionism and self-judgment and instead embrace the messiness and imperfection of the human experience. 
and we can learn to trust in the journey, knowing that every step along the way is leading us closer to our true selves and our greatest potential. We can learn to be happy alone, not because we're settling for less or giving up on our dreams, but because we're choosing to be our own best friend, our own greatest ally, and our own source of love and support. So keep going, my friend. Keep showing up for yourself, keep cultivating self-love and self-acceptance, and keep trusting in the journey. Know that you are not alone, even in your moments of deepest solitude, and that there is a whole community of people out there who are rooting for you and cheering you on. And know that by learning to be happy alone, you are not only giving yourself the greatest gift, but you are also inspiring others to do the same. You are creating a ripple effect of love, joy, and fulfillment that touches everyone around you. And that has the power to transform the world in profound and beautiful ways. So let's keep going together. Let's keep learning, growing, and discovering all the incredible things we're capable of, both alone and in community with others. Let's keep embracing the journey of self-discovery and self-love, even when it feels scary or uncertain. And let's keep reminding ourselves that true happiness comes from within and that we all have the power to create the life we desire no matter what challenges we may face. Let's be our own best friends, our own greatest allies, and our own sources of love and support. Because when we learn to be happy alone, we open ourselves up to a world of endless possibilities and opportunities for growth and transformation. We become a beacon of hope and possibility, reminding others that they too have the power to create a life of joy, fulfillment, and purpose no matter what their circumstances may be. So let's do this together. Let's learn to be happy alone and let's create a world where everyone has the tools and the support they need to cultivate true happiness and well-being from the inside out. Let's embrace solitude as a path to our greatest potential. And let's inspire others to do the same. Are you ready? Let's keep going one step at a time, one day at a time, one moment at a time. And let's trust that the journey itself is the destination. And that every step along the way is leading us closer to our true selves and our greatest happiness. Thank you for being here, for showing up for yourself, and for being willing to embrace the journey of learning to be happy alone. You are a true inspiration, and I am honored to be a part of your journey. So let's keep going, my friend. Let's keep learning, growing, and discovering all the incredible things we're capable of. And let's keep reminding ourselves that we are never truly alone, even in our moments of deepest solitude. Because we are all connected, all part of a greater whole, all part of a love that knows no bounds. And when we learn to be happy alone, we tap into that love, that connection, and that sense of belonging that is our birthright and our greatest gift. So here's to the journey, my friend. Here's to the ups and downs, the joys and the sorrows, the moments of clarity and the moments of confusion. Here's to the incredible adventure of learning to be happy alone and of discovering all the beauty, wonder, and possibility that lies within us and all around us. And here's to you, my friend. Here's to your courage, your resilience, your wisdom, and your strength. Here's to the incredible being that you are and to the incredible journey that lies ahead. May you always remember that you are loved, that you are worthy, and that you are never truly alone. May you always find the happiness, peace, and fulfillment that comes from within, and may you always inspire others to do the same. Thank you for being here, for being you, and for being a part of this incredible journey of life. I am honored to walk beside you, and I can't wait to see all the amazing things you'll create and discover along the way. So let's keep going, my friend. Let's keep learning to be happy alone, and let's keep creating a world of love, joy, and possibility one moment at a time. Here's to the journey, and here's to you. Thank you for being here.